con la frase. Siamo? Sì. Ok. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to our second Rome Med Dialogue promoted by ISPI and the Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs. We are honored, extremely honored, to have with us Professor Gassam Salame. Welcome and uh, thank you, Professor, for being with us. Thank you, Dr. Magli. Uh, Professor Salame, from 2003 to 2020, has held international positions. Senior advisor to the UN Secretary General, political advisor to the mission in Iraq, member of the Commission on Rakhine State in Myanmar, head of the UN support mission in Libya from 2017 to March 2020. Uh, Professor, you have uh, an incredible experience and worldwide experience in uh, conflict, uh, in conflict resolution, in mediation. And let me immediately start into a first question. Uh, there is a, a, an ongoing worldwide debate on the big changes or accelerations in our world originated by the pandemic and what's going on after that. Yet, if we look at the news, we still see conflicts and peace processes stuck in endless crisis. You have been, as I said, constantly working for dialogue conflict resolution, peace. What is your overall assessment on the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic for the international system, especially in the Arab world? Well, thank you very much. I am, I'm, I'm still worried. I'm still very worried because giving an answer while the COVID is still going on, something quite difficult. Uh, two days ago, the WHO was telling us that 185,000, 100,000 uh, new cases have been registered across the world, which means that the virus is still with us and is changing the international system in different ways. What I'm worried with is the fact that it goes into countries uh, that contrary to Europe or the United States or even Russia, do not have the means to fight against it. And this is a possibility. Fortunately, it hasn't so far, uh, like Africa or to a large extent, India. But if it does, then we may have really serious problems, humanitarian problems. In political terms, I think that the pandemic has to a certain extent uh, aggravated a number of factors we have seen in, uh, the interna in international politics. First, there is uh, the question of the relevance of international organizations. When the Security Council is unable to produce a resolution on the COVID the way it did on Ebola many years ago, I'm worried. If people start looking at the European Union and say it's an irrelevant organization or it is not helping me as a member, I'm worried. If the Arab League of State does nothing 
for the Arab countries when it comes to COVID. I'm worried. If the United States decides not to pay the World Health Organization, I'm worried. So there is a cluster of issues around multilateralism that are now questioned and very seriously so. And I hope that by the end of the crisis, what appears to be a serious crisis of multilateralism will be behind us. Otherwise, I don't see how to replace it. Multilateralism is extremely important. I am not talking about globalization. A lot of people mix globalization, which is a process, mainly a financial and economic process, with multilateralism, which is not a process. It's a decision taken by nation states in order to cooperate, to stand up to serious challenges, peace, war, COVID, etc. I think that I understand that the public opinion has taken thoughts about uh, uh, globalization right now, but it should not have second thoughts about multilateralism. Quite to the contrary, uh, multilateralism is needed more than ever. And this is the one item I am worried with uh, right now. On this topic, Professor, uh, you recently said that the pandemic has radicalized populist movements, and so we need a radicalization of multilateralism. Can you elaborate on this? Uh, I think the, those who support multilateralism have been on the defensive of late, saying, no, no, the WHO is okay. No, 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 the Security Council will work after all on other issues. No, 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 don't worry about the European Union. It ended up reacting the right way with, with a delay, etc., etc. We were on the defensive as supporters of multilateralism. While you could see that those who are looking for closing the borders, nationalism, not looking elsewhere, doubting international cooperation, were becoming much more vocal in their nationalist, sometimes chauvinist attitude. That's why I think we need, as supporters of multilateralism, something I am, I'm, I'm not sure everybody is supporting multilateralism. But if you support multilateralism, you need to come first with a deep faith in it, to express it and to come with new ideas and probably new institutions. If the present institutions do not work the way they are needed or supposed to work, we could look for other institutions. But we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, fight against the virus that crosses the borders locally. We cannot fight against climate change locally. We cannot fight against all these big issues now locally. We need a certain level of international cooperation. And I see that those who hate international cooperation are becoming much more vocal. And those who like it are somehow uh, more, uh, more shy in their attitude. Uh, you know, in, in Europe, we have experienced that uh, uh, versus the European Union. Yes. Those who are, uh, which is a form of multilateralism, regionalism, because those who are, uh, uh, who were and are against are extremely vocal, and their reply was uh, uh, very feeble and very uh, shaky. Very shy. But, but, but you see, we, we bringing in our conversation some hope, uh, the European Union. Uh, after the, the beginning of the crisis, uh, very uh, disordered uh, uh, approach is showing that the more you divide yourself as we did with lockdown, then suddenly you realize you should and you have to try to group up. And uh, the, the, the European negotiation is not done yet, but it's much better the situation at the European level than it was four or five months ago. Uh, let, let me move, you mentioned, of course, the, the international organization and uh, the, the, the one who are more interested in, in talking with you is clearly the, UN, the United Nations, the United Nations, and its humanitarian and mediation effort, especially in the MENA region. 
Do you think it is possible and how to turn the pandemic into, like in Europe, a stimulus for enhancing dialogue and stemming regional conflicts? How? Well, the Secretary General called for a ceasefire in order for the government to sort of deal massively and seriously with the COVID. It didn't happen. Yeah. First, the Security Council didn't endorse it. And second, in many areas, in Yemen, in Libya, in other places, uh, it was not respected. I think that the COVID has to a large extent, unfortunately, spared the Middle East and North Africa. So far. So far. And I hope it will keep sparing it. But I believe that if the danger had been more serious, more present, if the number of victims had been much more serious, possibly some of the groups fighting against each other would have taken this call much more seriously. Uh, when I talk to my friends in, in Libya, in Yemen, in Syria, in Iraq, I swear, telling them about this call, they used to say uh, COVID is a European issue, later an American issue. We don't have COVID here, it's not serious. We have war here and uh, war has its own logic and it is not affected by a virus that is hitting here and there. I believe something else is now clear to us all. The military spending of medium powers has gone beyond recognition, up beyond recognition. Uh, and I think it's time that we ask ourselves the question, is the world going into less multilateralism, uh, weaker alliances, uh, more of a sort, everybody defends himself, and therefore needs even more weapons, uh, etc. Or is the world going into more multilateralism, more cooperation, a vaccine tomorrow that is given free of charge to everybody? I think we should ask ourselves this question. What is happening in the conflicts in the Middle East and North Africa are clearly a, an amplified role for regional powers in feeding the conflict. Uh, as far as Libya is concerned, I should say that I tried my best to give non-countries that are not directly involved, in particular, the European Union and four European powers, the British, the Germans, the French, and the Italians, plus the European Union, that made five out of 10 people around the table in Berlin. I tried to give them the role of leading, leading a, a reasonable path. Uh, I don't, I think they missed the opportunity to a certain extent, but they can still work on the conclusions of the Berlin conference. And in the Berlin conference conclusions, there is something that is crucial, which that the mercenaries should leave within 90 days of the ceasefire. Because now we are seeing in the Middle East different levels of interference. We are seeing direct interference by selling weapons, by using the weapons yourself, by sending mercenaries, by financing the war effort of somebody else. All the levels of interference we are using. But the Americans have ceased to play the role of a sheriff and the Security Council is divided and the Europeans are not uh, uh, sort of uh, serious enough in their effort to produce peace. Therefore, we are in a situation where the Middle East and North Africa can live with conflicts for a long time, 
And here I would like to be very precise on one point. And that is the relationship between civil wars and the war on terrorism. I understand that many countries come and say, what the Middle East needs is to fight terrorism. Daesh, Qaeda, Zarqawi, you name it. I agree with that. But if there is a lesson we can draw from Yemen, is that for many years, terrorism has been fought, notably by Mr. Obama's drones, but the civil war erupted and all the investment on the forces, local forces to fight terrorism were lost because all these forces were used in the civil war. Something of that kind is happening also in Libya. If you fight terrorism and you extract it from the general environment of what is happening in the country, is the country produce oil, producing oil? Is it producing the kind of institution it needs in order to, to have peace? Is it producing the public services people need not to be attracted by terrorism? If you don't do that, if you take the war against terrorism, and extract it from the local political environment, you end up having very short-term successes. You kill that terrorist, you destroy that terrorist cell, but the risk remains what it is. That is why I believe that the shortcut, let's fight terrorism and let's forget about the rest. It's not our role, neither to build states, nor to build nations, nor to help reestablish institutions, etc. It's a very short-sighted view. And I see this short-sighted view in Iraq. I see it in Syria. I see it in Yemen. I see it in Libya. And I see it also in my own country in Lebanon. Yeah, wow. I mean, this is a, a strong point, and we at ISPI, we have made uh, uh, several uh, workshops and seminar in stressing uh, exactly what you're saying, that the war on terrorism taken uh, by itself, uh, it's misleading. Uh, if uh, you don't consider uh, uh, growth, uh, uh, social justice, uh, public services, and whatever. Uh, Professor Sami, Uh, you mentioned in this first part of our conversation the problem of multilateralism uh, and you linked them also to the pandemic, but we all know that uh, multilateralism, multilateralism was facing challenges before the arrival of uh, coronavirus. Now, now you, you, don't, you are not working for the UN, you are not... Uh, 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 you, are, you are a free man. Uh, okay, you mentioned that one issue is the United States not uh, playing their previous role of sheriffs. But which other countries are mainly to blame for the failure of multilateralism, especially within the UN? Look, I, I, I believe that the UN uh, is in bad shape. Uh, you can look at it from various uh, angles. First, I believe that questions like climate change, like uh, the fight against the pandemic, like uh, gender parity are very important issues. But I also believe that the main role of the UN is to produce peace and security. And in the past years, I think this primacy in the charter of the production of peace and security has been somehow challenged. I'm not happy with that. This, you want my personal view? I'm not happy with that at all. It is not that I'm old fashioned. It is that the UN has been produced for that. First and foremost, as a, a body of collective security. And we cannot forget that. We should concentrate on that. Of course, if you are unable to produce enough on that level, you try to be useful on other levels, like climate change or gender parity 
or you name it. There are so many issues in the world. And I fully agree with that. I respect that. But still, I believe we are not. During the Cold War, the Security Council was sort of blocked by the mutual veto. Nowadays, we are blocked by the disintegration of the idea of collective security. It's not there. It's not there in the council. But I will add something else. Uh, some people will not like what I'm going to say, but I have to say it. Please. <clears throat> I think we have gone in the 80s through an era of financial deregulation. What is called neoliberalism. It produced some effects, more investments, more transfer of money, etc. But it also produced a number of tragedies across the world. We are now going through a deregulation of force. Now, everybody who has the means to do something and the lack of constraints internally. In Italy, you cannot do whatever you want with your army because you have a constitution, you have a parliament, you have a budget. But there are countries who can go beyond all these constitutional and legal constraints and have the means to operate. And they operate and there is nobody to tell them you can do that. That's what I call the deregulation of force we are attending right now, we are witnessing right now. And that makes, let's face it, that makes democracies weaker. Weak. Yeah. Why don't we say it publicly? Because, not because democracy produces weak regimes, because democracies need multilateralism. They need that everybody has domestic or external constraints to put a limit to his behavior. If you don't have it internally, because you can play with constitution or you can ignore your constitution, you can ignore your public opinion, you can ignore your parliament, and you do not have an external power, security council or a concept of big powers or whatever to contain your behavior, then it's free for all. And I am worried about the deregulation of force today, the way I was worried 20 years ago was the deregulation of force. Uh, professor, you, you didn't mention uh, uh, any country, but it was uh, 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 easy to get your reference to, uh, considering the Middle East, to Russia, Turkey, and other. And uh, on, on Syria, someone uh, may say that uh, this power uh, uh, the, in the Astana process uh, somehow managed to stabilize the situation. <clears throat> we may not be happy on the way it, is, it has been stabilized, but <clears throat> so someone may object to what you're saying that it's true. We are deregulating uh, the, the use of power, the use of military force, the peace process from the UN to other actors, but they are somehow successful. How would you object? Or Look, what happened, what happened in Syria and what is happening to a certain extent in Libya as well, is that uh, you have the plan B, which is those who interfere come to somehow an agreement on how not to let, allow things to go much worse. So, which is another way of looking at producing peace and security. You can produce peace and security by putting a rule, by having a mediator, by having non-engaged countries mediate among stakeholders. And you can have some kind of security by having those who interfere in the situation coming together and trying to find some limitation to their use of power and to their proxies use of power. But this is plan B or plan C. I'm not against it, but it is not plan A. Why? Because if you look at Syria, 
First, it didn't produce the kind of peace and security in Idlib and elsewhere, because every day there is a new challenge to this Turkish-Russian understanding somehow. Either because the proxies do not listen to you or because you tend to try to push your advantage. Second, and more importantly, this kind of production of peace contains the damage, but doesn't produce something positive. We don't have a new deal in Syria. Yeah. We don't have an agreement in Syria. We don't have a new constitution in Syria. It's somewhere in the air. They agreed to have a constitution, but the day we'll see this constitution, probably, probably my grandson will see it. I don't know. I mean, so I am not against those who interfere coming together and trying to limit the damage, to contain the damage, to put red lines, like the attempt now by the Turks and the Russians to have some kind of a red line that runs from Sir to Zufra in Libya. I'm not against, but this is a plan C or a plan D. A plan A is to bring the stakeholders in Syria or Libya or Yemen or Iraq together and to have them agree on something, on a way out that is acceptable to most of them, if not to all of them. Which is the role of a political solution versus a military external solution, uh, and which is something you, you have been working uh, most of your life on, uh, and also in, uh, in some of the countries we mentioned. But what are the fundamental principles to build confidence among opposing sides and to get a shared result? And, and why, according to you, have failures and stalemates become so frequent in the MENA region? I think there are different reasons for that. The most important reason is what I call the deregulation of force. Nobody is telling anybody who wants to intervene anywhere, <laughs> you go back home, don't do it. Nobody, let's face it. Unless he decides that it's too costly or too irrelevant to him, and he stops by his own will, nobody is telling him go back home. But there is a second, which is the international environment. Sometimes the ingredients of an, of an agreement are there, but the international environment is not conducive to put it in practice. I give you an example. To a large extent, in the civil war in Lebanon in 1983, we came to an agreement. Then we called it the constitutional agreement. Then we came to another formulation of this agreement three years later in 1986, it didn't apply. Then in 1989, an agreement that, that was not fundamentally different from the one we had reached in 83 and 86 came to be implemented and that was the type of agreement. Why then? Because of Gorbachev, because, because, of, Peri Gorbachev. Gorbachev. Okay. because of Perestroika, because of the fact that the two superpowers have come to the to Malta or near Malta in a boat, and they decided that the war, uh, Cold War is ended. And the number of small conflicts across the world, in all of, of Africa, in uh, Central America, in Lebanon and elsewhere, were immediately, immediately solved. So you badly need a mediator, okay, a good mediator, okay. But this is not the most important thing. You need the ingredients of an agreement, and you can find them. I can tell you what are the ingredients of an agreement in Libya. They are known, they are known to all Libyans, but then you need an agency to implement it. An agency to implement it, that's where you lack the UN. That's where you want the UN to play a very important role. Because if you tell people, these are the ingredients of an, of an agreement and you don't put any pressure on him to accept it, he will say, I still have all the time to accept it. I may be able to change the balance of power to my advantage before accepting. 
So he needs to pay a price for delaying. In Lebanon, we paid 50,000 people killed between 1983 and 1989 until we discovered that war is very costly for us. The Libyans need to understand that. The Yemenis need to understand that. The Iraqis, the Syrians need to understand that there is a price in delaying. And our role is to remind them of this price. But for that, you need a stick. And the stick doesn't exist if the Security Council is divided. No mediator in the world can move up in a situation if those he's talking to know that the, behind him, people are not in agreement. They look at you as a representative of the international community and they know that not only the international community is divided, but it is possible that the international community doesn't exist in the first place. So who are you representing? In order to, to have some influence, right? otherwise I left Libya while going everywhere. Not a single door for two years and a half has been closed before me. People do not say, I don't want to see you. I want to listen to you. I want, but will they abide by their commitment? For that, persuasion is not enough. Even if you speak the language, even if you talk to them, even if the door is open for you anytime, as it was before me, and I thank them for that. You need something else. You need some kind of pressure, some kind of being able to tell them, if you do not listen to me and do what you need to do, there is a price to be paid. This I didn't have really. I'll, I'll give you an example. So those who are listening to us understand how, how, how it works. Uh, during my stay in Libya, we had three oil crises. The so-called oil crescent crisis, the Sharara crisis, the, the oil uh, crisis was in, the oil crescent was in 2018, Sharara 2019, and the closing of the wells by Mr. Haftar in 2020. Yeah. In 2018, 2019, the pressure on Iran was very heavy and Venezuela was in very deep trouble. So everybody worried about the market and the price were very high. Everybody worried that the Libyan oil will not, will be subtracted, extracted from the market. Everybody wanted the market with as much oil as possible from outside Venezuela and Iran. So countries used to call me morning and night, hey, what are you doing? So I had, when I went to see the stakeholders in Libya, I could speak in the name of Mr. X, Mr. Y, who are the leaders of the world, who told me, you go and you solve this issue of the oil. In 2020, all the wells were closed. Hey guys, but the oil barrel was at $30 and a lot of countries were interested in having less oil in the market than more oil in order for the prices not to. So I was begging them, hey guys, this is the same like last year. No, 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 it's not the same. The market is different now. So it tells you something about what I call the stick. If you go with all these countries, you can speak in their name and tell them, you open the wells. Because the Europeans, the Americans, the Russians, everybody wants you to open. Okay, that's one thing. If he knows that nobody is very eager to see the Libyan oil in the market again, he will listen politely to you. No, I, it, it's, it's interesting because we had in, in different uh, format uh, uh, stuff on the Mistura, uh, Peterson, and now you. And you are all describing really uh, the most impossible job in the world. I mean, being uh, uh, at the, working for the UN in mediation and working as special representative uh, in countries like Libya or uh, Syria. Uh, 
with this condition, it's really a, a very tough job. Uh, you, you clearly mentioned that the, the, the stick is also having behind you uh, united, the big power united in willing something. But did you suffer more too much of Rus Russia or too less of America? Well, you suffer from great powers, but differently. All <laughs> differently. Uh, of course, uh, the American concentration on the war against terror without equal attention to the other ingredients of, of each case in Syria and Lebanon and Libya and elsewhere. Uh, is something that makes your life difficult. The fact that Russia uh, supports one side very clearly, as it did in Syria, and to a large extent in Libya as well, also is, is, is a problem. Uh, I believe that uh, great powers can be a problem for you as SRSG, but in a very different way. As the Catholics would say about sin, they can sin by commission or they can sin by omission. And uh, very often they make your life difficult because they sin by commission, but more often than not, they make your life difficult because they sin by omission. And talking of uh, omission, uh, I have to ask you something about Europe. Uh, uh, in your role, in your last role, uh, what did you miss mainly from Europe? Uh, you mentioned, because we talked about Russia, we talked about the uh, United States, in Libya, we also have other countries involved, but, but let's spend a few words on Europe and, and what you felt was missing and should have be there on the country? I think that I was unable, it's my fault probably, unable to convince them that the Berlin process was a great opportunity for them. They were, they were half of the room and uh, it was taking place in a European capital. Uh, uh, many of their permanent requests have been integrated in the conclusions. And uh, we have been able to bring the Turks and the Russians also around the table. We were not certain about the American representation, but at the end, Mr. Pompeo came. So I don't want to be critical, but I would say that the Europeans didn't raise to the occasion. That was and I remember, I said publicly, if we don't go this road, the alternative is war or Astana too. What do you want? What do you want? If you want to play a useful, positive, active role, this is the way. This is a highway before you. Uh, I think some inter-European uh, hurdles remained there. Some countries were asking why Berlin and not uh, here or there. And uh, some others were saying, is it serious? Will Putin really come? I mean, I think the Europeans could have risen to the occasion. I am not sure the Europeans will have uh, another opportunity like Berlin before us. It could be that it's already too late. But uh, I believe something else that we accused the Americans of being obsessed with the war on terror and sometimes of downplaying other factors. I don't think that the Europeans are better in their obsession with migration. As if migration can be settled as an issue without the emergence of a legitimate unified structure in Libya. 
Could you do that? I don't think you could. It will stop for a few months, come back. The pressure is there. Look at the figures. And my grandson can expect pressure, demographic pressure, to remain with us for, for a long time. Unless you have strong, open-minded cooperation with North African countries, you can't go far. You can stop here, there. You can have a trick one day with this city, with that port, with that group, etc. Okay, but you want a solution to the migration issue. You need to start there. So most of the questions I was asked by the Europeans is about the role of the NGOs in the Mediterranean, is about migration. So, okay, these are serious issues, but the settlement or the solution has to go through state building in Libya itself. And that's with the six tracks Berlin has created after six months of work with representatives of the various countries. It was not a one day thing. It was a six months hard work. I think answer the question of imminent threats as well as long-term threats, but the Europeans were not against Berlin, but they did not sort of own it and run with it and push for its implementation immediately. I haven't seen that. And let, let me, on this issue and on another one, let me take two questions which are coming from our uh, participants. Uh, the first one you partially answered already, but let me have it to you. Uh, uh, Germany uh, will assume uh, the European presidency next week. Based on your experience, do you think Germany will have a chance to unite the European front and try to revive the Berlin process during the next six months, uh, which is number one? And the second question is uh, uh, from someone else is, we didn't mention China so far. What about uh, China? Yes. Uh... Well, we didn't mention China, not because we believe that China is not the emerging power it is. It is the emerging power it is. And you have heard what Mr. Trump is saying. You have heard others, even Mr. Macron and others, considering that the possibility of a, of a Cold War, new Cold War between China and the US is, is very likely. Uh, but it so happens that China is not directly interfering in most of the conflicts we are talking about. Uh, although I think it's taken advantage of these conflicts by just remaining outside them and by waiting until the time where reconstruction is needed, when you need a superpower that is not involved directly and doesn't come with conditions on human rights and things, etc. I think in due time, you will see the Chinese around. But for the time being, China is not interfering directly in any of these conflicts I know of. Now there is another issue uh, that has been raised. Uh, of course, Germany is going to chair the European Union uh, in, a, in a week time. Uniting the European is possible, but this is not the issue. The issue is moving the Europeans, which is different. You can have the Europeans sit around the table and agree on the same communique. And they agreed to Berlin conclusions. And they helped, and they were helpful in producing the UN Security Resolution 2510 that came after the Berlin Conference. So, so the Europeans can unite. But the issue, the issue can they move? Can they say, look, if you keep interfering in Libya, sending arms or using your air force or whatever to country X, I am going to stop investing in your country. If you do not do this in Libya, I am not going to help you rebuild your hospitals because of COVID. I am not going to, if you interfere, Nobody has put on the table something a stick. So why would you have an interfering country X, I'm not naming any country, 
refrain from interfering if you do not say there is a price for interference. Yeah, but the counter price would be Turkey saying, okay, uh, if you don't reconstruct my hospital for coronavirus, I send two million migrants to Europe, which is the obsession, as you said. So in terms of... Europe didn't put on the table anything, as far as I know, to any of those eight or nine countries interfering in Libya. Because Turkey is not the only one. No, I'm just so, taking one example. There, there are a few countries interfering in Libya. And as far as I know, no sticks were put on the table. We are in an era of deregulation of force. If you do not show sticks, persuasion is not enough. I thank and congratulate, in fact, Madame Merkel for her role in bringing all these leaders together in making the Berlin conclusions we have prepared for her uh, acceptable to everybody and in helping produce the resolution 2510. But what I was expecting from the Europeans in general is something a bit more, is to move and show the beginning of a stick. I remember that the Israelis kept destroying the Gaza airport and the Europeans kept rebuilding it. There is one day when you should tell, I'm not going to rebuild it. You stop destroying it because next time I will not rebuild it, but I am going to do this and this to you if you keep destroying it. it can, uh, Europe cannot be the peace bankers. If Europe becomes the peace banker, it will be the victim of a permanent uh, deterrence against it, because others will use arguments. I mean, uh, Europe is not, uh, is not a rich inheritor that is the victim of permanent threats from left and right. There is one day where Europe needs to say, look, I'm not going to pay for it. I'm not going to pay. I'm not going to help you. I'm not going to uh, to be the good man in the room because this does not help. Uh, in the Arab-Israeli conflict, in many other conflicts, this was not done. Certainly not in Libya, certainly not in Yemen. The Europeans have been helpful in fighting against terror, but uh, how, how they are going to approach the reconstruction of Syria, conditionally, unconditionally, we're going to see. But the mere asking of the question tell us something about where, I heard Mr. Bolel saying that we need also to use force to speak a language of force. I hope the Europeans are able to do that, but without it, the sort of default position is that Europe is a peace banker. It finances peace, but the architect of peace is somebody else. Uh, there are many questions coming from the audience. Uh, let me try to group some of them, uh, Professor. Uh, one is uh, your assessment uh, 10 years after the Arab Spring what lesson can we learn from that experience, which would be the topic of two books, but I, I, I'm sure you, are, you will be a, as quick as you have been on all the other topics. Then someone uh, ask, is asking you to say a few words on your country, which is uh, Lebanon, which is uh, uh, facing hard time. And uh, uh, let's start with these two. I'm worried about my country. My country has to face COVID like everybody else. My country has to face a region that is in trouble uh, in Syria, in Iraq, uh, on the Israeli-Palestinian uh, file now with this risk of annexation of parts of the West Bank, which is a very serious problem. But my country on top of that is paying the price of 30 years of mismanagement, political mismanagement. We have a political class that shouldn't be there, 
and I wish it disappears the way some of the statues are disappearing across the world because it has mishandled public finance big time. We have selected 20, 30 years ago to go into a monetarist policy, Friedmanian monetarist line, putting the exchange rate of the Lebanese pound above anything else. And we have destroyed our economy by choosing that line that made a lot of bankers richer, a lot of millionaires billionaires, but destroyed the economy of the country. And now we are paying the price for it. So it's a, it's a difficult time. Uh, I'm trying to help at least with the educational sector so it doesn't collapse by next September the way the banking sector has collapsed. But some other people who are better than me at that should help with the health sector so it remains mm -hmm. able to deal with the COVID. And uh, we certainly are at the dawn of a very difficult negotiation with our uh, lenders and in particular with the IMF. And I hope the Lebanese are united at least as a delegation when they go and discuss with the IMF, which I'm not sure of. So I'm worried about my country and I hope I'll be able to be there to try and help in the various areas where I can help a bit. As far as the Arab Spring is concerned, this is an expression I have never used in my life, not because I am against all this turmoil that took place in the past 10 years, but in general, because I believe it's legitimate and rightful and I am all for it, for people to express themselves. I believe that we uh, came at a moment where people were somehow fed up with the idea that uh, there is a financial and economic opening that took place in the 90s of last century, but there is no uh, similar political opening. So they started demonstrating, in fact, first against nepotism, which was very, very common uh, across the region. And then somehow this movement of turmoil and protest was not able to produce its own leadership. Therefore, authoritarianism came by the kitchen door, saying it's the barracks or the mosque. What do you prefer, the barracks or the mosque? The whole idea was to find a third way, a third way where institutions can be there to contain both the mosque and the barracks. Unfortunately, this was not the case. Unfortunately, this was not the case. Nowhere? Sorry? Don't even consider Tunisia as a... Uh... It's one case. It's one case. We should mention Tunisia in order to be nice with the Tunisians and because it's... <laughs> no, I don't it's, want to be nice. I just want to look no, at your opinion. It's, a, it's somehow an exception where they were able because they had more stable institutions to somehow mm, contain the popular movement and translate it into uh, stable institutions. I won't say it's the same elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it led to a fake election. Sometimes it led to the return of the military. And sometimes it led to an impasse on the ground with no real solution in view, as is the case in, in, in Syria, for example. That is why I don't expect this uh, era of disturbance to stop very uh, quickly. I think uh, the stakeholders are not happy with what happened so far. And those who were able to contain the gravity of the protests are not in a position to build stable and durable powers. Therefore, I am afraid we are going to have more of it across the region, not necessarily in the same countries, but in other countries, or in the same countries, but with new stakeholders in the weeks to come. Which is, by the way, a question who just arrived and you answered. The question was, if you were expecting a second and possibly different wave of protest on Arab Spring. It never stopped. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's like COVID. 
Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I lost you. Professor? Oh, sorry. We, we, I lost you in the screen. I, I, I say, everybody's saying there could be a second wave of COVID. But the day before yesterday, we had 185,000 cases. So before the second wave comes, we'll let us first finish with the first one. And if yeah. you look at, at the graph, it's still frightening. I mean. So it is the same with tur turbulence in the Middle East. Turbulence in the Middle East and North Africa has been around for 10 years. It didn't really stop any moment. So we are not going to have a second spring or a second season. It's not the Four Seasons, the beautiful symphony. It's something else. It's a, it's a protest movement that started for legitimate reasons, uh, but was not able to translate itself into a political force that can come and uh, revitalize the institutions in a more democratic and active way. Uh, professor, I have so many questions and we have uh, so few minutes to go. So I'm sorry, I will not be able to ask you everything that, was, that I received, but uh, le let, me, uh, let me take a couple. Uh, someone is mentioning that we have been talking now for approximately an hour and we hardly mention Iran. And uh, the second is, uh, second question is, uh, how could the region be impacted by the possible implementation of the Netanyahu Gantz uh, program? And the third one which, on which we will conclude is a personal question. Uh, uh, as an intellectual, as a, uh, as a diplomat, as a, as a public figure, how did you live uh, through the pandemic? How did you cope with the restriction? Uh, how did you, do you judge the problematic relationship between collective health security and personal freedom? Let's keep this one as the last one. So we okay. don't end up with a big crisis uh, on... Uh, <laughs> All right. Okay, well, so, we didn't mention Iran because the, the topic of our conversation today was peacemaking or mediation in the conflicts of that region. And it so happens that the, the, with Iran, what, uh, the, what the international community has come to was a deal at one point on the Iranian issue, on the Iranian nuclear issue. And it so happened, as Bolton writes in his book, that one day Mr. Trump decided to get out of this agreement. And we are now going to see how we can contain the damage. How not to have Iranian react in a very negative way in the region or going back to its nuclear program. And how uh, to bring back some kind of moral authority to a country that signs something. And one day Obama goes and Trump comes and he basically says, I have nothing to do with it. I mean, you can't keep a high level of moral authority if you do not respect somehow the word of your predecessor and the job. And that's the problem we have with Iran, that all these sanctions, all these, etc., can be defended by the present administration, but still there was a deal and this deal, uh, I don't think the Americans came with an alternative to just say, I don't want to abide by it. So uh, it's, it's the elephant in the room. It's in, uh, the, the one who asked the question is right. Uh, but you could see the Iranian role much more actively in countries like Iraq, Syria and Lebanon and certainly Yemen, than North Africa. Uh, and that is why any of these conflicts, you need to have the Iranian factor in mind when you deal with Lebanon, when you deal with Syria, when you deal with Iraq, uh, for sure. The second question... Uh, Netanyahu Gantz annexation. Uh, well, the Israel has been uh, ruled by uh, the nationalist right for now more than 20 years. 
And at every election, people discover that there is more right than the right, that it can go even more to the right, which means that there is uh, in the uh, Israeli electorate a, a, a sort of an attitude that is basically not antagonistic with more annexation and more settlement. But to believe for a second, for a second, that this will end this issue would be extremely naive. This issue will explode big way. And this Israeli greed, territorial greed, I think the Israelis are going to pay dearly for it because it makes any possibility of sidelining the issue, which is their dream, impossible. And it, will, it could take more religious, more religious uh, colors, but to think that this conflict will be behind us the day the Israelis will eat the whole of West Bank is just naive. This conflict is not a territorial issue. This is not a real estate, you and your neighbor. It's a very, very symbolic and highly mobilizing issue for every Muslim in Kuala Lumpur and Nigeria, for every Christian in Rome and uh, wherever, and for every Jew everywhere. It's not a, a, a conflict between neighbors. Uh, do you take the Armenian quarter of Jerusalem or etc.? This way of presenting the things does not take into consideration the explosive, symbolic, and very emotional uh, nature of this particular conflict. Let's leave this gloomy scenario because we don't want, we are uh, over time. Well, we I, to I close I, with I, this. I, I very frankly, uh, very frankly, had a small heart problem in Libya while mediating in February. So I needed a small procedure in my arteries and I decided to do it in, my, in one hospital in Paris. So I came to Paris to do it and I was confined three hours later. <laughs> so it is not my choice. Uh, it is... Uh, 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 so it came at a good moment in the sense that I went to my study where I'm talking to you. You see my books behind me. And there were so many books and magazines and journals who came to my address during the two years and a half I was in Libya that I was so happy to open New Yorkers from 2017, New York Review of Books from 218, books sent by my colleagues who wrote all these books and sent me with autographs I have never seen. Probably they were angry with me that I didn't send back, thank you for the book you sent. So I spent three months basically making up for the fact that I gave Libya 24 hours a day of my life for two years and a half. But I missed important processes and the word I should, I usually follow. So I, I had the opportunity to use this confinement in order to make up for my ignorance of so many processes going all over the world of which I was not very cognizable because of my entire dedication to Libya for two years and a half. Professor, it has been extraordinary. You have been kind, generous, uh, inspired and inspiring and uh, even personal in the last comment. So we are extremely grateful to you. It has been a real pleasure. We hope to see you, inshallah, in Rome for the real MED in December. Good luck for everything and real thanks from all of us. Thank you very much, Professor, for inviting me. Thank you. A great pleasure. Thank you.